Hi friends, how are you today? My name is Bailey Sarian and today is Monday, which means it's murder, mystery, and makeup Monday. <laughs> Theme song still going strong. If you are new here, hi. How are you? That's great, okay. Every Monday I sit down and I talk about a true crime story that's been heavy on my noggin and I do my makeup at the same time. If you're interested in true crime and you like makeup, I would highly suggest you subscribe. I'm here for you every Monday, baby. Last week we talked about Jim Jones and the Jonestown situation. Wow, yeah. It's really all you can say about that story. Today, I'm going to talk about Rocky Myers. It's sad, but hopefully I'm praying it will have a happy ending. So let's get into it. Actually, if you're curious to know what I'm using on my face, I do list the products down in the description box. So check that out. But other than that, I will shut my dirty little trap and get right into it. Okay, so on the night of October 4th, 1991, a woman by the name of Mammy Dutton, uh, she was asleep in a bedroom at her cousin's house in Decanter, Alabama. So Miss Dutton, she was staying at her cousin's house. Her cousin, uh, her name is Ludie May, and she lived in what was considered to be a rundown neighborhood that struggled with a lot of crime. It had been dubbed crack town by the locals. At around midnight, she heard somebody ring the doorbell. Dutton, she like looks out the window to see like who's who's here at midnight, you know? And she sees her cousin, Ludie May, talking through the window blinds with a man that was on the porch. Now he seemed to be really irritated. This is according to Miss Dutton. She could hear that he was telling her cousin that he had been in a car accident and he needed to use a telephone to call his family and get some help. Ludi May, she offered to dial the number for him. Dunn was still in her room and she could hear that whoever was outside had come into the house. I believe it said that like, she kind of just had this iffy weird feeling about it all, but she heard Ludi May, her cousin say that her husband was in the other room, which at first she thought that's such a weird comment to say because she wasn't married. And then after just like a few minutes, she hears Ludi May scream at the top of her lungs. Now, Dutton was still in the bedroom and she said that she was just frozen with fear, like she couldn't move. She heard the scream, she knew something bad had happened, but she just was paralyzed with fear and she did not leave the room. So the man he runs into now Dutton's room, stabs her in the side, and then he runs out of the house. She didn't manage to get a, like a really clear look at him, but she did note that he was wearing a light looking shirt. That was really all she could, she could make out. The man runs out of the house, she's been stabbed in the side, and she comes out of her room, and that's when she sees her cousin, Ludie May, was laying on the couch bleeding with her phone in her hand, and she sees that she's been stabbed four times, but she had managed to dial 911 and was on the phone with police. She was still alive. There was an officer who had been patrolling the, the area nearby. Um, so he was able to get there pretty quickly. Once the police arrived, I mean, Ludi May was obviously hysterical as you know any of us would be. She was still conscious and she was able to describe her attacker to the officers. She said that the attacker was a male, a black male. He was stocky and short and he was wearing a light colored shirt that looked like it had blood on it. An ambulance rushed her to the hospital, but the stab wound to her chest had pierced her heart. And not long after arriving, she was pronounced dead. Yeah, I know. I just kind of like came out right out the gate with just awfulness. Okay, hi. <laughs> So after Ludie May's murder, detectives searched her home for any forensic evidence that they could find, right? As I hoped they would do. They lifted a number of fingerprints, including one partial palm print, and they had determined that a VCR was missing. That's what was stolen, okay? Oh, also I forgot to say, this is quickly a side note. I'm gonna be throwing a lot of names at you. Get ready, get ready to catch it. Then the day after, Ludie's murder, a local man handed over to the police department a VCR that was matching the, the description of the one stolen from Ludie May's house. Now this man said that he found it at his sister's house. Now his sister had lived just a few blocks up from uh, Ludie May's home. The sister was running the property as a shot house where people could come and buy whiskey and beer. A local drug dealer named Butch sold drugs from the porch. 
Butch over here, his whole operation was no secret to law enforcement. They knew of one another, okay? And it was said that police worked with Butch. There were rumors that he'd been given a de facto license to sell drugs in exchange for information and other favors on people or anything they needed. So police call in Butch. They want him to come in so they could do some questioning, right? Butch also brings along one of his partners who went by the name Roadrunner. I know, okay, just listen. After questioning, the two men signed statements saying that a regular customer of the shot house who went by the name Anthony Cool Breeze had traded the VCR for drugs on the night of Ludi May's murder. Butch would go on to say that this guy Cool Breeze had showed up to his, his home on the night uh, Ludi May was murdered. And when he showed up, he had a VCR with him. He was sweating and shaking and he seemed extremely paranoid. So who's this guy Cool Breeze? Well, Cool Breeze over here was known, well, he's well known in the neighborhood. He was a heavy drug user, but his family was well respected in town. I mean, they had been around forever. So everybody just knew the family. But then police got another phone call or another tip from a woman who lived in the neighborhood and said that she also had seen Cool Breeze run into the alley near Ludie May's house on the night of the murder. And this person she thought she saw Cool Breeze was wearing a white shirt and it was stained with blood. So then detectives put out a warrant for Cool Breeze's arrest. They end up picking him up at his place of work. At that time, he's working at an aluminum aluminum plant. They bring him in. Now then the governor issued a reward for further information about the murder to see if they could strengthen their, their case. A few weeks later though, a local man who also knew Cool Breeze for nearly 30 years came forward to claim the reward. He was saying that he'd seen someone. It wasn't Cool Breeze though, nay nay. No, he said that he was near Ludie May's house and he saw somebody uh, with a VCR on the night of the murder. Also, this person who came forward to say it wasn't Cool Breeze. Well, guess what? Of course, this person worked alongside Cool Breeze's father for years, so. Okay, so then detectives call back in Butch and Roadrunner they come back into the station to give another interview. This time though, both men recanted their statements. Roadrunner claimed he said it was Cool Breeze because he was angry over an argument that they had had. And Butch said that he backed up Roadrunner's statement because quote, I just figured that's what everybody wanted to hear, end quote. Now they said that the story they originally told was still mostly true. A man had come to the shot house asking for drugs on credit the night of Ludie May's murder. Who who then returned later with a VCR to trade. They now are saying a man named Rocky Myers was the one who came to the shot house with the VCR. Okay, so who's Rocky Myers? Well, Rocky Myers grew up in New Jersey. He was one of 10 children and his relatives would describe his life as just a hard life. His father was an alcoholic. His mother battled with depression um, after having her first child at only 14 years old. When when Rocky was young, it was apparent that Rocky had a really hard time keeping up with other kids his age. And at the age of 11 years old, he was diagnosed with an intellectual disability. Um, it was said that Rocky was very kind, but he was just very misunderstood. He didn't excel like his brothers did in school. He struggled big time. And Rocky never learned how to read above a third grade level. At the age of 16, he still couldn't tell time. Rocky um, later on, on in life, he would go on to get married and he would have four children of his own. Now Rocky's children who are now adults, they would go on to say that he was a good dad. He was very loving. He had his struggles with drug abuse, but he never left their lives or abused them. Now Rocky and the family, they would find a house and eventually settle down across the street from where Ludie May lived. Rocky would do little odd jobs by helping his friends and family with what Whatever they needed while his wife worked at a local restaurant. At the time of Ludie Death's murder, Rocky was a regular drug user. And while he'd been arrested before for theft, he'd never been charged with a crime involving any type of violence. When Rocky did have money, he would walk up a narrow alley that ran three blocks up from his house to Butch's shot house, remember Butch? And he would go there to buy $10 or $20 worth of 
drugs. Homicide detectives turned their focus now onto Rocky, who was on probation for receiving stolen property. Detectives called Rocky in and they had him do a drug test, like a urine test. Rocky ended up failing, which was a violation of his probation. So because of this, violated his probation, he was then sent to jail. And while he was there, he was now interrogated by police officers. Now, normally interrogations are filmed or recorded, but of course, two detectives who were questioning him did not film or record their interrogation. So we don't really know like what they said or what happened, but the detectives said that, <laughs> because you could trust them all the time, but the detectives said that they just asked Rocky some questions and that Rocky ended up admitting to using crack, but he denied knowing anything about Ludi's murder. Rocky then went on to say that he had never met this guy Roadrunner, and also he had never met Butch before. People who were questioning him asked Rocky if he knew a person by the name of Marzell. Rocky said he did. So this guy Marzell was an associate of Butch, who in his own words, quote, sold drugs, watched houses, and did basically anything anything he needed at the time, end quote. During the interrogation, they tell Rocky that this guy, Marzell, had made a statement saying that he had seen Rocky give a VCR to Butch the night that Ludi May was killed. And in the following hours, he admitted knowing Butch and Roadrunner and said that he had indeed traded a VCR for crack at the shot house um, on the night of the murder. Rocky denied that he had been at Ludi May's house that night. He claimed that he found the VCR stashed in the alley that runs between his house and the shot house. When the person who was questioning Rocky told him that he, he needed to confess because he was facing the electric chair, it was said that Rocky started crying and asked to speak with his mother. But to the detectives, the fact that Rocky had initially lied and the statements they had from Butch, Roadrunner, and now Marzell saying that they saw Rocky with the VCR was all they needed. And Rocky was now charged with capital murder of Ludie Mae Tucker. Two years later, Rocky's trial begins. The prosecutor told the jury Rocky's drug addiction had overwhelmed his judgment. And after Butch refused to give him crack on credit, he broke into Ludie Mae's house and killed her for her VCR. But there were parts of the prosecution story that just simply didn't add up. Multiple witnesses described Rocky's attire that night when they saw him at the shot house and he was wearing black or dark brown clothing rather than the light colored clothing that Ludie Mae and her cousin said that the man was wearing. Roadrunner, he had testified. Cool Breeze had also been at the shot house on multiple occasions that night and at one point he was sweating really hard and he was wearing a white shirt with blood on it. Also, Rocky had terrible eczema. Even the detectives who were interrogating him had noted that Rocky had very flaky, rough skin. And this was important because the prosecution was saying that Rocky had been in a violent struggle with Ludi. If that was the case, then why wasn't there any dry, flaky skin found at the scene? There wasn't any, there was nothing. Like you, if you're in a violent struggle, struggle, you might have flaky skin left behind, I would imagine. Also, the biggest evidence would be that there was prints found inside of Ludi's home. There was a palm print, there was some fingerprints they had found, and none of them, none of them, none of them in the house had matched Rocky. Also, Roadrunner, <laughs> I'm sorry, Roadrunner, mm -hmm. he testified saying that the alley that was leading to the shot house was a well-known stash spot, saying that he himself had gone there often and would find hidden stolen goods and drugs there, which police had arrived to Ludie May's home just minutes after making her 911 call, making it possible that whoever did it could have stashed the VCR in the alley once they heard like the, the sirens approaching. So in fact, there was absolutely no evidence that Rocky had even been at the scene of the crime aside from the fact that he had a VCR. During Rocky's trial, he actually took the stand and he testified on the afternoon of Ludie May's murder. He had indeed bought drugs from Butch and then he went back to his home and he decided to smoke it there. Rocky said that he had planned to go to a club with his in-laws, but when he arrived at their house, 
house, they had already left. So he decided to just walk back home. And that's when he spotted a VCR that was hidden under a bush in the alley. So he took it and then he takes it to the shot house and he traded it for drugs. But he was adamant he had nothing to do with Ludie May's murder. So years later, um, Mammy Dutton, the cousin that was there the night of the murder, well, she told a lawyer working on Rocky's appeal that she and Ludie May had seen Rocky across the street earlier that day. Ludie May, she had mentioned that she knew him from the times that he'd come over and knock on her door and ask for ice. And that Rocky surely knew that Ludi May lived by herself. But if you remember, on the night of the murder, Miss Dutton said that she heard her cousin tell the attacker that her husband was in the other room, remember? Mm-hmm. So during the jury selection, one of the jurors said that if a suspect made it through a grand jury, he was quote, automatically guilty, end quote. And an investigator assigned to the case interviewed another juror who openly used a racial slur to refer to Rocky and then also constantly called him a quote unquote thug. These these jurors shouldn't have been picked in the first place is what I'm trying to get at. Anyways, at least three other jurors didn't believe that there was enough evidence to actually convict Rocky. But as hard as they tried, they couldn't get the rest of the jurors to to change their minds. 11 of the 12 jurors were white. 11 of the 12 were white and most were set on voting guilty. They decided to vote for a a guilty verdict, which is just... (laughs) Then Rocky was convicted of capital murder and the jury provided their recommendation of life without parole to the judge. The verdict was shocking to Rocky because he was convinced that his trial would end with his acquittal. Few months later, let me tell you this part because this is a real cherry on top, baby. A few months later, the judge who was in charge of the case had exercised his option of judicial override. You know, what is judicial override? Well, (laughs) let me tell you. What it means is the judge had the power to get rid of the jury's recommendation of life without parole. And instead, this judge sentenced Rocky to death. From the bench, he said that the jury had been too, quote, emotional in choosing not to recommend the death penalty and described Rocky as a, quote, threat to society. End quote. Only three states have ever allowed the practice of judicial override in death penalty cases. Florida, of course, sorry, Delaware, Oh, I always forget about Delaware and Alabama. But in 2016, the US Supreme Court ruled that Florida's judicial override statute was unconstitutional and soon Delaware Supreme Court banned the practice in their state as well. Alabama's use of judicial override was probably the worst out of all of them. Before the practice was banned in 2017, an organization called the Equal Justice Initiative calculated that more than 20% of inmates on death row in Alabama had their sentences imposed through judicial override. In Alabama, state judges are elected by popular vote and they often emphasize their tough on crime record or stance while campaigning. According to Alabama, being tough on crime means locking up innocent black people. I said it. According to another Equal Justice Initiative study, the use of judicial override to hand out death sentences in Alabama often spiked. It went up during election years. Of course it does. In Rocky's case, the judge who imposed his sentence was facing re-election. Makes sense, huh? It's all adding up, it always does. Now the practice is no longer allowed. Great, we love that. But anyone who was on death row by the judicial override has stayed there despite the acknowledgement that the practice was unjust. So why are they still there? After his conviction, Rocky was transferred to Holman Correctional Facility where Alabama carries out its death sentences. His trial lawyers actually filed an appeal, which was unsuccessful. Once the appeal of a death row inmate's initial conviction is denied, there is a lengthy process 
process that can last for decades. There's another process called the habeas corpus process, which offers inmates the chance to present new evidence. This is the stage in the death penalty process where many sentences have been overturned on the basis of poor representation by counsel at trial, the recanting of witness testimonies, or new evidence of misconduct by prosecution, police, or juries. So it's just, it's a very important process, especially if it's for somebody who didn't have a fair trial. So in 1998, a young Tennessee-based lawyer named Earl Swartz, this man, Swartz, he worked on Rocky's case for over five years. And in 2003, he received a notice that Rocky's petition for a post-conviction appeal had been denied. That's not good. So the next step was to prepare to file a federal habeas petition. I know it's getting really confusing. It's okay. So federal habeas corpus review, extremely important state in a death penalty case because it allows death row prisoners to bring federal constitutional claims that were heard in court but were not successful. And in federal court, their judges are appointed and not elected. So they're not trying to impress anybody with, look at how many people I put on death row, you know? It gives you some hope. But by then, Rocky's new lawyer, the Swartz guy, he actually started working at a new law firm. Good for him. But here's the problem. Um, yeah, he didn't tell Rocky that his state appeal had been denied. Rocky wouldn't even find out for another year. Now this is important because you have a limited time to file the next step in order to move forward. So not letting Rocky know about this, he dropped the ball big time. So the Swartz guy, he decided that he could no longer represent Rocky. But here's the thing, he uh, failed to tell Rocky this. He just didn't tell anybody and just disappeared on Rocky. So all this time Rocky's sitting on death row thinking that, you know, this lawyer is still working for him and hopefully making some progress, you know? A year later, Rocky received a letter from the state attorney's general office saying that he'd missed the deadline to file any further habeas corpus petitions and noted notifying him that Alabama would be moving forward to set an execu execution date. Now again, I don't know if you remember this, but Rocky could only read at a third grade level and he had to ask a fellow inmate to read the letter aloud to him so he could understand it. Fellow prisoner who read the letter to Rocky was represented by the Equal Justice Initiative and he reached out to the organization to ask for help for Rocky. Attorneys working at the organization wanted to help and immediately filed a habeas petition, but it was too late. The state of Alabama argued that Schwartz's failings were irrelevant, saying that Rocky should have been on top of his own case. And it's not Schwartz's fault, it's Rocky's fault. In an interview, Rocky said, quote, a lot of people think that people on death row know the law. They know this or that, but I don't. I give all my trust to my attorneys and stuff. If I could read the law in the books and learn and study, I would, but I am not able to do that. I'm not a learnable type of person." End quote. Now new lawyers are working on Rocky's case. They hear something that's just shocking. And it's a story from a guy named Marzell. Marzell was Rocky's acquaintance who had testified seeing him trade a VCR in the shot house. We mentioned him earlier. It's okay if you don't remember. There's a lot going on. Marzell, he was arrested while driving a stolen car in decanter. And Marzell told the attorneys that one detective had offered to make the arrest disappear if he would say that he'd seen Rocky Rocky bring the VCR to Butch at the shot house. Marzell stated in his testimony in Rocky's trial, he was quote, not truthful, and he did not see who brought the VCR to the shot house that night. Marzell went on to say that quote, Detective Boyd told me that he would take the stolen car I had been driving and leave it by the side of the road, end quote. So they look into this and they're looking at police reports and whatnot. And they see that there are police reports out there that actually support this time timeline or Marzell's story. Two suspects were indeed arrested in a stolen vehicle matching the one described by Marzell on October 28th, 1991. The same day the police notes indicated they first interviewed Marzell. A federal judge determined that this new statement from this guy Marzell, it wasn't enough to override Rocky's failure to meet the habeas corpus deadline. Even with the new evidence, the case was effectively closed. Okay, so where are we now? Rocky 
Rocky Myers is still on death row. In an interview, Rocky said, quote, when I'm praying, I tell the Lord I'm terrified. I just don't show up because it don't do any good to other people. But inside, in my mind and heart and stomach, I'm scared, end quote. Well, let me tell you, there really isn't any options for him because his options have been denied. So what are we gonna do? Well, let me say, I don't quite know all the laws. There's so many, there's a lot of laws. Different states have different laws. Like how um, the death penalty works, it's just weird. It never makes sense. It's like people just sit on death row forever. I, I don't know, I, I don't fully understand it, and I, but I do know this. Alabama loves the death penalty. Like they really enjoy it, it seems. The state of Alabama decided to offer like a new way of execution, which was going to be asphyxiation by nitrogen gas as an option for execution. They're currently working on the protocol or a protocol for a new method. So once they, they do so, then Rocky will be given a new execution date. Take your time, Alabama, take your time. Rocky has said in an interview that it's been sad and frustrating to watch other prisoners get breaks in their cases and be released while he's been pretty much shut out of court. Rocky said, quote, there's a lot of people who support the death penalty, but to know that there are people on death row that could be innocent, how can you support that? End quote. The only chance for Rocky to avoid execution is a grant of clemency from Governor K. I. V. Now I don't know much about this lady, Governor K. I. V. Do you know that she is 74 years old and she is part of the Republican Party? She stepped in to replace Alabama's previous governor, Robert Bentley, who quit in 2017 when information came to light that he was using campaign money for personal use and he had been having an affair with his senior political advisor, which honestly, I hate it when people bring up affairs because I really don't think that's anybody's business. But like he was being, it was intense. So he stepped down and um, so that's when Governor Ivy stepped in. And I'm sure she's done some great things, I'm, maybe. But when I Googled her, you know what came up? <laughs> in 2017, she signed into law the Alabama Memorial Preservation Act, which prohibits moving or changing memorials, including the numerous memorials to the Confederacy around the state. So she did that. That was like one of the first things she did. And then guess what? I, I scrolled, I went to page two on Google. Guess what I found there? Well, ooh, in 2019, Governor Ivy was in the middle of a scandal when information came out that in 1967, she wore blackface for a skit she participated in. Now I understand 1967, that's, that's 20 years ago. Oh, fuck math. You know, this came to light a year ago and she came out and offered her heartfelt apologies for the pain and embarrassment she caused. And Governor Ivy said, quote, I will do all I can going forward to help show the nation that the Alabama of today is a far cry from the Alabama of the 1960s, end quote. So you guys, this is my microphone. So you guys, I'm thinking, hey, we should hold her to this, <laughs> okay? Right? Yeah. So here's what I'm gonna do and here's what I need you to do, okay? Down in the description box and my pinned comment, I'm going to leave a link where you can sign a petition to help save Rocky Myers. Unfortunately, Governor Ivy has, has to be the one to grant Rocky clemency, which is like, uh, but, Hey, hi, I'm Bailey. I'm just some random girl on YouTube talking about true crime and doing her makeup. I know it's ridiculous. I'm ridiculous, but there's a big but here. Yeah, okay. We, and I say we, have power. I need you to sign that petition. Rocky's innocent. He doesn't deserve to be on death row. And there are many, many, many more stories similar to this of people on death row who don't deserve to be there. Let's try, let's try and do something, can we? Great, I don't ask much from you guys. I ask you to make good choices and to stay safe. Sometimes I ask other things, I don't know. But please sign this petition. And I also need you to do something else. I also need you to register to vote. I know, annoying. But when you register to vote, not only do you get to vote, but listen, you also can be picked for jury duty. And I know a lot of you guys right now are rolling your eyes or exiting this video, but here, listen to me right now. Listen, we need to get out of the mindset that jury duty sucks. It does suck, but, and it's a big but, 
It's important to remember that our country needs juries to check the work of our representative and judges and assure that justice is done, but also it's fair. Without our participation, that's when abuse of power happens. I know it's a little random for me to sit here and talk about jury duty, but I think a lot of people forget how important it can be and the jurors should be a broad spectrum of the population, a mixture of race, national origin, and gender. Rocky had a 99% white jury in Alabama. You think that's gonna go? You, Rocky was set up to fail from the start, like so many others. So that's why I'm saying it's a, we need to participate more, okay? We need to do that. And I also need you to sign the petition. So I hope we can help get Rocky out. And if that doesn't work, then we can make a lot of noise to Governor Ivy which I am more than happy to do. Let me know your thoughts down below. I love and appreciate you guys so much. Make good choices. Please be safe out there. And I'll be seeing you guys later. Bye. Oh, P.S. Before I leave, I just feel like I need to say this. I don't believe that like all people in Alabama are bad. I just think the people in charge are pretty shitty. I just have to say that because people are always mad at me over something I said. Okay, thanks. Bye. <laughs>